Chapter One of the Hand of Fu Manchu. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Hand of Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter One The Traveller from Tibet. Who's there? I called sharply. I turned and looked across the room. The window had been widely opened when I entered, and a faint fog haze hung in the apartment, seeming to veil the light of the shaded lamp. I watched the closed door intently, expecting every moment to see the knob turn, but nothing happened. "'Who's there?' I cried again, and crossing the room I threw open the door. The long corridor without, lighted only by one inhospitable lamp at a remote end, showed choked and yellowed with this same fog so characteristic of london in november but nothing moved to right nor left of me the new louvre hotel was in some respects yet incomplete and the long passage in which i stood despite its marble facings had no air of comfort or good cheer palatial it was but inhospitable I returned to the room, reclosing the door behind me. Then, for some five minutes or more, I stood listening for a repetition of that mysterious sound, as of something that both dragged and tapped, which already had arrested my attention. My vigilance went unrewarded. I had closed the window to exclude the yellow mist, but subconsciously I was aware of its encircling presence, walling me in, and now I found myself in such a silence as I had known in deserts, but could scarce have deemed possible in fog-bound London, in the heart of the world's metropolis, with the traffic of the strand below me upon one side, and the restless life of the river upon the other. It was easy to conclude that I had been mistaken, that my nervous system was somewhat overwrought as a result of my hurried return from Cairo, from Cairo where I had left behind me many a fondly cherished hope, I addressed myself again to the task of unpacking my steamer trunk, and was so engaged when again a sound in the corridor outside brought me upright with a jerk. A quick footstep approached the door, and there came a muffled rapping upon the panel. This time I asked no question, but leapt across the room and threw the door open. Nayland Smith stood before me, muffled up in a heavy travelling coat, and with his hat pulled down over his brows. "'At last!' I cried, as my friend stepped in and quickly reclosed the door. Smith threw his hat upon the settee, stripped off the great coat, and, pulling out his pipe, began to load it in feverish haste. "'Well,' I said, standing amid the litter cast out from the trunk and watching him eagerly, "'what's afoot?' Nayland Smith lighted his pipe, carelessly dropping the match-end upon the floor at his feet. "'God knows what is afoot this time, Petrie,' he replied. "'You and I have lived no commonplace lives.' Dr. Fu Manchu has seen to that, but if I am to believe what the chief has told me to-day, even stranger things are ahead of us. I stared at him, wonder-stricken. That is almost incredible, I said. Terror can have no darker meaning than that which Dr. Fu Manchu gave to it. Fu Manchu is dead, so what have we to fear? We have to fear, replied Smith, throwing himself into the corner of the settee, the Sifan. I continued to stare uncomprehendingly. The sea fan! I always knew, and you always knew, interrupted Smith in his short, decisive manner, that Fu Manchu, genius that he was, remained nevertheless the servant of another, or others. He was not the head of that organization which dealt in wholesale murder, which aimed at upsetting the balance of the world. I even knew the name of one, a certain Mandarin, and member of the sublime order of the White Peacock, who was his immediate superior. I had never dared to guess at the identity of what I may term the head centre. He ceased speaking, and sat gripping his pipe grimly between his teeth, whilst I stood staring at him almost fatuously. Then, evidently you have much to tell me, I said with forced calm. I drew up a chair beside the settee, and was about to sit down. "'Suppose you bolt the door,' jerked my friend. I nodded, entirely comprehending, crossed the room, and shot the little nickel bolt into its socket. 
now said smith as i took my seat the story is a fragmentary one in which there are many gaps let us see what we know it seems that the dispatch which led to my sudden recall and incidentally yours from egypt to london and which only reached me as i was on the point of embarking at suez for rangoon was prompted by the arrival here of sir gregory hale willem attache at the british embassy peking so much you will remember was conveyed in my instructions quite so furthermore i was instructed you'll remember to put up at the new louvre hotel therefore you came here and engaged this suite whilst i reported to the chief a stranger business is before us petrie i verily believe than any we have known hitherto in the first place sir gregory hale is here here in the new louvre hotel i ascertain on the way up but not by direct inquiry that he occupies a suite similar to this and incidentally on the same floor his report to the injure office whatever its nature must have been a sensational one he has made no report to the indy office what made no report he has not entered any office whatsoever nor will he receive any representative he has been playing at robinson crusoe in a private suite here for close upon a fortnight it has since the time of his arrival in london i suppose my growing perplexity was plainly visible for smith suddenly burst out with his short boyish laugh oh i told you it was a strange business he cried is he mad nayland smith's gaiety left him and he became quite suddenly stern and grim either mad petrie stark raving mad or the saviour of the indian empire perhaps of all western civilization listen sir gregory hale whom i know slightly and who honours me apparently with the belief that i am the only man in europe worthy of his confidence resigned his appointment at peking some time ago and set out upon a private expedition to the mongolian frontier with the avowed intention of visiting some place in the gobi desert from the time that he actually crossed the frontier he disappeared for nearly six months to reappear again suddenly and dramatically in london he buried himself in this hotel refusing all visitors and only advising the authorities of his return by telephone he demanded that i should be sent to see him and despite his eccentric methods so great is the chief's faith in sir gregory's knowledge of matters far eastern that behold here i am he broke off abruptly and sat in an attitude of tense listening then do you hear anything petrie he rapped a sort of tapping i inquired listening intently myself the while smith nodded his head rapidly we both listened for some time smith with his head bent slightly forward and his pipe held in his hands i with my gaze upon the bolted door a faint mist still hung in the room and once i thought i detected a slight sound from the bedroom beyond which was in darkness smith noted me turn my head and for a moment the pair of us stared into the gap of the doorway but the silence was complete you have told me neither much nor little smith i said resuming for some reason in a hushed voice who or what is the si fan at whose existence you hint nayland smith smiled grimly possibly the real and hitherto unsolved riddle of tibet petrie he replied a mystery concealed from the world behind the veil of lamaism he stood up abruptly glancing at a scrap of paper which he took from his pocket suite number fourteen a he said come along we have not a moment to waste let us make our presence known to sir gregory the man who has dared to raise that veil End of chapter one